Chapter 4, August 5th through 8th, Murderers. August 6th, Above, Gathering. The rescue crew brought back no clues about the men down in the mine. The only official word was a bulletin as cold and silent as a rock. The assessment of the terrain indicates that there is a blockage in the mine's main shaft. Still, family, friends, relatives, and other miners rushed to the site, as if being near the hole in the earth would bring them closer to the missing men. Workmen came carrying shovels, wishing, dreaming that they could move mountains and save their neighbors. They were scared, angry, and holding on to one last emotion like a precious lifeline. Hope. We hope they are all fine, a relative of one of the miners told a reporter, but we are also angry because we have no information. Zymina Matas, the governor of the Atacama region, finally spilled, spelled out exactly what was known. At least 34 men were missing, that was later corrected to 33, they were about 900 feet underground, which meant some four and a half miles of winding road cork screwed to them, down to them, and it was entirely blocked by the 700,000 tons of rock that had fallen down. No one was sure why the cascade of rocks had sealed off the mine, whether men were given poor directions and blasted off the rocks that should have never been touched, setting off the avalanche, or if the earth moved on its own. But that was not the question. Causes could wait. For the moment, all anyone could think about were the consequences, the men trapped in the mine. The one possible piece of good news was that there was a space set aside as a refuge in the area below the collapse. As Matas explained, there was a shelter with the basics needed to support people for a time, such as oxygen, protective gear, overcoats. If the men were alive, and if they managed to reach that space, they would be able to survive for perhaps a few days. Many, many ifs. And even if they were in the shelter, how could they get out? August 7th, above, failure. Overnight, a bonfire became a home in the desert. The anxious people huddled together around the flame, worrying, wandering. No one was leaving the mine, even if there was nothing anyone could do but wait. But wheels were turning. The newly elected president of Chile arrived and personally promised the families of the trapped miners the rescue operations would continue with all the strength in the world. Indeed, Lawrence Goldborn, the nation's top minister of mining, was at San Jose taking charge. Two days earlier, San Jose was a mine out of sight, ignored nothing like the vast operations that so impressed Dr. Chavez's students. In America, mines are required to have two escape routes, and they must be at least 500 feet apart so that if one is blocked, the other may still be clear. Chile has similar rules, and they are carefully enforced in the big mines. San Jose did not have, and never had, a single escape route. It did not matter enough to anyone to make sure it did. It was always a dangerous place to work, a miner recalled. All of us who went in there would wonder, will we make it out? But as reporters started to arrive at the disaster site, Chile's leadership knew it must act. The new president was elected on the promise of promoting business. He needed to make sure the whole world saw Chile as the home of those clean, modern mines. The country's reputation as a center of good mining practice now rested on the fate of 33 men who had disappeared, eaten by the rock, the mine, the silence. Something had to happen fast. The main road down was shield, sealed shut, but there was one other path, an air shaft. Could enough rock be cleared from it to send tr uh, trucks rumbling down to the men? By now, more than 130 rescue workers had reached San Jose, enough bodies and equipment if the mine was stable. Crews started down the shaft, but rocks began falling again. Man scampered up back up to safety. The earth was not done moving. Neither the main entrance nor the air shaft was safe. August 8th, above, tears in the night. The bonfire blazed again, holding the families together through the night. Now there were some chairs, blankets, a single tent going up, but news of a co second collapse seemed like a death sentence for the relatives. Reporters heard anguished wailing. Later in the day, some men ran to the mine as if they could battle their way down themselves. Murderers, they shouted at officers from the mine. Even Minister Goldburn was shaken. As Alonzo Soto reported for Reuters Goldborn, his voice cracking admitted that the easiest, most logical way in is now blocked. Experts are going to have to find other alternatives, but those will be tougher and take longer. Where could Goldburn find the best, the very best experts? Above, the lieutenant. The deepest underground copper mine in the world is El Tenente, the lieutenant. It is high on a hill in Chile, but it is nothing like San Jose. At one time, the home to some 16,000 people, it had its own hospital, its own train line, and it now owned and run by Codoco, which is actually a division of the government. Andre Sorgarin, an engineer, and Rene Aligar, a risk management expert, were sent to El Tenete to bring their special knowledge to the Atacama Desert. 
And they were not alone. People were flying into Chile from around the world to help, but too many hands are almost as bad as too few. The helpers needed a plan. August 5th through 7th, below, facing the truth. Victor Segova was on his way up, out of the mine when he saw rocks falling down, and there was no way of escape. Dust was blowing everywhere, getting in the miners' eyes, temporarily blinding some and leaving the others blinking back tears. Hundreds of thousands of tons of falling rocks sent a blast of air through the mine that made Yanni Barrows feel like his ears were being sucked from side, one side to the other. Segovia turned and ran away from the light into the darkness. Three men quickly took, their, took roles as leaders. Mario Gomez, the eldest, the irrepresentable Mario... Mario Sepuliva, a big-spirited miner, known for his jokes and sense of humor, who seemed to find new strength in the crisis, and Luis Urzia, a shift foreman. Urzua looks like an old-time catcher on a baseball team, that round, thick, solid guy who gets nicked and knocked by the stinging foul tips, the blazing fastballs, and the sliding spikes, but is the backstop holding the team together. He is a veteran miner who is known to be very protective of his people. In that terrifying fine moment, most of the men trusted him, they knew that Urzira was not only a good man, but savvy and careful. We always say, he explained later, that when you go into the mine, you respect the mine and hope you get out. Respect is the key to survival underground. Even the most careful miner cannot stop rock from falling, but he can improve his odds so long as the earth behaves. Ron Mishkin shakes his head sadly when he says, Every accident that I've seen came from someone being foolish. Most of the men were trained. They knew there was just one safe place. The only thing we could do was run down into a shelter, which saved us from certain death. Urzua gathered men and gave them assignments. One crew got in a truck and drove up, seeing how far they could go. But there was so much dust in the air they couldn't see the road and crashed. Not good. Yet Urzia quickly realized that even the accident brought useful knowledge. They could not go up. So all their attention would have to be on surviving below. Some of the men were talking about being stuck for a couple of days. But when Yurzua saw the rock and dust, he knew otherwise. The good news, the men were alive, together in the shelter. The bad news, they were isolated, in darkness, so complete they could not even see one another. They could only make out the sounds of other frightened voices, with no way to tell the outside world where they were or that they were alive. They were buried beneath the rock, breathing, but buried. Since they were near underground magna steams, it was seriously hot. 90 degree temperatures with 90% humidity. All Segova could think about was to let my family know I was alive, but there was no way of doing it. Many times I lost hope. Hope. It is such a frail word. Hope offers nothing concrete, no plan, no schedule, just a wish, a prayer, a belief. It flickers on and then flicks off. And when it goes, the blank darkness, the icy silence is easily filled with rage. That is what was happening around the bonfire above ground. The same was true deep inside the mine. Some of the miners were sure they were lost, that they would starve. We were waiting for death, Richard Villararo admitted, and the black air anger flared. Already, they were splits. Five of the miners were not part of Urzua's crew. They insisted on tunneling back up. There was an air shaft nearby, but the ladder was to it was too short, and then a boulder sealed it shut. And some miners say there was a third group, which stood against both Urzua and the five. Fist fights were breaking out. After all, you can hit a guy you don't like, even if you can't make a dent in a rock. Urzua did not have time for fights. His concerns were food and water, then waste. He had to figure out how to meet their most basic needs, but that also created a great opportunity. If the men were all working together, they would keep working together. The rule down below was the vote. According to Urzua, with 33 men, any issue would have a majority and everyone would have, have had his say. That may ha not have been true at first, but there were really three different clusters of men. But still, voting worked to bring the men together. You just have to speak the truth and believe in democracy. That was how he was going to save his men, by telling them what they really faced, and by making sure everyone shared and believed in their common decisions. There were 20 cans of tuna fish, one can of peaches, one can of salmon, and some crackers in the shelter. Since there was no way to know how long the fish would have to last, the ration was tiny. We talked about it at the first meeting we had when we were trapped, Villarol recalled. We all agreed that we should all share the food that was there. You just had to rough it. Every 24 hours, eat a small piece of tuna, nothing else. Small, meant as little as possible. About half a soda bottle cap full, every 12 hours, along with a sip of milk, which was turning sour. A bite of canned peach and a cracker. Oily water, drained from the large container set aside to be used for machines, which the men found stashed throughout the mine shaft, joined the milk. 
They all knew how much food there was. They had voted on how to use it. And then your zoo suggested that they all eat together, in the same place at the same time. As long as the food lasted, it would belong to all of them. There was no chance to cheat, no possibility that someone else was getting extra on the side. It was hard, but equally hard for everyone. In these very first decisions, so Beliva and Yerzir took leadership as a voice of the group. The bond holding them together was stronger than any one man. Water. The men had machines that could claw down into the earth, and there is water below the desert. But every time you run an engine in a closed space, you feed car exhaust into the air you breathe. They needed to create a well with, with as little use of the machinery as possible. Yerzua sent them on the well digging task then sent another crew to map out the space around them. They needed to dig another smaller hole, their bathroom. Of course they needed water and a place for their waste, but all this action served another purpose. It changed hope from 33 frail and separate, separate dreams into a shared goal they were working toward together. You only need water if you will survive. In each of their minds, they were scared, but as a group, they were acting like people who will be rescued, who are preparing for their rescue, who are building their own path to safety. In those first days, there were fights in the mine, and there was strength in the mine. No one could know which would crack first, the men's tempers or their hope.